treasuring and measuring this week on the Laura Flanders show. If cities manage to resist Donald Trump's return to the failed tough on crime policies of the past, can they use positive affirmation to improve policing? We'll talk to the Brooklyn Borough president and others here on the Laura Flanders show where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Forward-thinking policing. It's not what we're hearing from Washington. Donald Trump campaigned on an old-fashioned, tough-on-crime platform, pledging a return to the failed stop-and-frisk program touted by his advisor, former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani and Michael Bloomberg. Stop and Frisk was ruled unconstitutional in 2013 after years of targeting mostly innocent people of color. After much toing and froing that's still going on in the courts, the city all but abandoned the program. And guess what? Crime is down. The fact is, crime was already going down under Stop and Frisk. Today, New York's crime rate is at a record low. Shootings, murder, rape are all down, in contrast, unfortunately, to what's happening elsewhere in cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Chicago. The NYPD credits better police work, closer targeting, improved technology. The trend has held steady while the department all but abandoned stop and frisk. And Mayor Bill de Blasio and his police commissioners, William Bratton and James O'Neill, have reduced incarceration rates. The city councils also eased up on marijuana prosecutions and petty crime. Now New York is the safest big city in the U.S. Mm -hmm and also the one with the fewest incarcerations for its size, according to Harvard's Kennedy School for Criminal Justice. So what's to learn from New York City and what comes next? If cities can manage to resist Trumpismo, what could they do after reforming the most obvious abuses to systematically reform the way we teach and practice keeping our cities, our people safe? For this special conversation, I am sitting, appropriately enough, in Brooklyn Law School. And I'm proud to be joined by three guests. Donna Lieberman is the director of the New York Civil Liberties Union, which was very active fighting stop and frisk. Judy Kamaki is a professor emerita of organizational behavior who's been working with unions and police departments to change performance measures, among other things. Eric Adams is not only the borough president of the People's Proud Republic of Brooklyn, <laughs> he also served for two decades on the NYPD himself, where he was a police captain before moving into politics. So welcome all. Really glad to have you. And I can hardly believe we are having a positive, forward-looking conversation <laughs> about policing. Um, but I I'm really glad that that's happening. Thank on you. that, um, borough president, what are the stats? What has changed in New York? How do you measure uh, it? I, I think that um, uh, first, those of us who um, really fought for progressive policing, um, as well as not being abusive, uh, we were saying for so many years that um, stop and frisk um, is a good tool. I use it as a police officer. It was the abuse of the tool. Mm -hmm. And any tool that is abused uh, moves from being a good tool to an abusive tool. And so. And just remind people, in case they don't know immediately what we mean by stop and frisk? Stop and frisk is when an officer um, has reasonable suspicion based on the behavior of someone, uh, believes that person has committed, is going to com uh, commit um, a crime, and he wants to make an inquiry to find out. The stop in question is just basically um, middle of the night. I see someone in the alley. I want to know, what, what are you doing here? It doesn't mean I'm to search you. Mm -hmm. uh, he can bump it up to search or frisk if, if he um, sees what is a, a weapon. So if someone has a small bag of marijuana, there's no way that police officer should have known that if he's still at that level. He could, if he could touch the outer garment of a person and uh, see that, is this a weapon that you're carrying so I could be safe and so you can be safe. Mm -hmm. If he determines that that is possibly a weapon, he can go in and search that area that he touched. He can't search the whole body. Mm -hmm. He can only search that area to determine if it is a weapon. What has happened, a uh, number of cases, one, uh, young people have been stopped, questioned, and told, empty your pockets and oh, that's a bag of marijuana, now I'm going to arrest mm -hmm. you for public view, 
or um, officers has just been jumping from, um, you know what, I got to fill this quota. I have to get a certain number of these forms prepared every day. So I'm just going to go out and based on the area I am in, I'm going to stop, search, frisk, and fill out this form right away. And the numbers we were looking at were extraordinary. I mean, Donna, you counted them. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of stops. At the peak, it was um, close to 700,000. And now what is it? Now um, we're, on, we're on track for um, about 10,000 stop and frisks uh, this year. And so yeah. what's your verdict on that? Well, that's good news. I mean, um, I think that, that everybody was saying, you know, when if the NYPD abandons its abuse of uh, uh, stop and frisk, you know, there's going to be a crime wave and we're still waiting for the wave, you know. Um, so that's really good news. Um, you know, there are other parts of policing that remain problematic. Um, um, and, and, and there are racial disparities in policing that remain you know, very problematic. And even though the numbers, you take marijuana arrests or summonses, even though the numbers of marijuana arrests and summonses are way down from their peak at like 55,000, um, it's still too high yeah. and it's still targeting people of color and we know marijuana is one of those crimes. We know the racial demographic of who smokes marijuana, who uses drugs and it's like white people use them just as much as, as, yeah. as people of color yet who gets arrested. How are you trained? What can you share with us about what training cops receive? Well, uh, uh, two things, I want to, uh, uh, Donna made a very important point uh, that we need to really underscore. One, the 700,000. Mm -hmm. um, Elliot Spitzer, um, when he was the AG, did a attorney report. General. He was the attorney general at the time. And Elliot Spitzer indicated that for every stop and frisk that was done, one out of every four times the report was actually prepared. So really, we need right. to, to, to get a true understanding of the right. numbers. Exactly. We need to multiply those numbers mm -hmm. by four. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about over, um, you know, uh, two million people possibly um, stopped and frisked. And the effect on that in terms of community relations uh, and all the rest. Right. It. And that goes, yeah. that goes to the foundation of, of what policing should be. We need to have a real national conversation on what policing is and what it's supposed to be and how are we training our officers and, and really uh, go back and have a paradigm shift to redefine um, uh, what a police department is. Well, that's just the conversation you're trying exactly. to, to spark, right, Judy? Yes, definitely. Talk a little bit about it. What definitely. are you seeing in terms of this national conversation that we're, we're participating in? Well, I, I think in? what, what Eric was saying was we need to actually start looking at what we really want police to do in a positive sense, not just negative. That is, we want to stop unwarranted stop and frisk. We want police to do constitutionally uh, able stops because it actually is a very helpful tool. And I think what I would love to see is dialogue about what are positive measures that we would like to see police exhibit. Now we've seen um, mayors and city police commissioners in all sorts of cities responding to assaults and critiques, most recently Mayor Rahm Emanuel in Chicago, but we're hearing it from everyone. What are you making of the kind of responses that you're hearing so far? Well, many of them are very negative. They identify what they don't want. Mm -hmm. They want to reduce ex the excessive use of force. Very often, though, they talk on the side. We want to instill community trust. But if you look at what they measure, what they measure mm -hmm. tends to be arrest, summonses, stops. They also will look at reports which aren't always made, of excessive force. But there are no measures of community trust. There are very few measures of de-escalation, which is identified as a way to avoid excessive force. So if I could suggest we would actually try to identify what we want police to do in a positive sense and then go ahead and use the adage, we treasure what we measure. Well said. I could not say it better. I had a conversation, um, two conversations that really stand out for me. I had a conversation with the mayor uh, a year and a half ago, 
And later, another version of that conversation with the now um, police commissioner, who's a friend, and I think has a, has a good heart, um, and the different responses. Um, if we want, uh, there's a distrust between police and public, and public and police. Mm -hmm. And that is built into the culture. We should say you have been on both sides of that. Yes. And you wrote about your own experience at the hands of the police when you were 15. And yes. then you served for whatever it was, 22, 22, 22 years. 22 years. And we need to erode that distrust. And that just distrust must be a built-in measuring tool. Um, how do we promote? How do we decide who's going to be a, a precinct commander? How do we give rank? Uh, Police should be out there every day. We have a municipal ID program. That cop should be on the corner handing out those forms, telling someone that, listen, you know what, we have a municipal, municipal ID program, be a part of it. That, the, the mother who goes in the subway station should be able to say, Officer Johnson, I heard your son just graduated. Congratulations. And yes, uh, Ms. John Jones, I heard your daughter mm -hmm. just had a baby. That's the relationship, because you know what happens with that communication? That's the same mother who's going to stop and say, there's a person who's selling guns in my building. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. the, 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 the relationship that developed. Bad guys talk. The good guys have this wall that they've been divided from each other, and we need to, I never thought I would borrow from Ronald Reagan, but we need to tear down <laughs> that, that wall. <laughs> but Donna, I mean, we've heard from people on this program before, particularly some of the folks involved in the Say Her Name, Black Lives Matter campaigns. Across the country, there are whole neighborhoods where people are not going to call the police because their experience is that is an, that leads to an escalation and often, especially in the case of women of color, um, sometimes fatalities. We've, mm -hmm. we've talked about them on the show. Mm -hmm. So how do you start turning some of that stuff around? Well, I, I think that Eric makes a good point. The police, you know, sort of starting perhaps with the Giuliani era, where uh, instead of focusing on neighborhood com policing, community policing, and policing, and that can mean a whole lot of different things depending on who's saying it, but, but, but policing that's based on relationships and respect. You know, the, the, the notion of, you know, uh, serve the community, not, you know, hammer and occupy the community. Uh, so I, th um, I think if, 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 there's, if we replace those, those SWAT teams and the SWAT team mentality with neighborhood policing, where people are in the communities, you know, day in, day out, and have a reason to and have a basis to develop relationships, it's, it's like a whole other, other um, uh, story. Are and, we just and going back, Judy, to the conversation about where cops live and where they well, come yeah. from? It, it, I think what I'm hearing from you is a bit more sophisticated than that. Well, I think, you know, the examples that both of you give about interactions in the community, if you really want that, you really want the officer to say, oh, Ms. Jones, I see, you know, your daughter's graduated, and there had to, has she heard about such and such a program, right? Because one of the measures of community policing that I suggested is called positive interaction. Mm. So and you'd actually so, measure that? Yes. And so um, both Donna and Eric have actually uh, been in favor of using body cameras. Body cameras have very often been used to identify the negative. But as Donna said, they can be used in a positive way to identify the positive. I love that. Mm -hmm. So if you use a body camera, you could actually have the officer be on record mm -hmm. as starting a conversation, just like Eric has talked about, and at the same time sharing something about himself or herself so that it's an interaction. So then you would have dialogue between individuals. Um, about meaningful things. The, the problem we're having in policing is that if you were to look at the men and women who lead the policies and police practices, they were police officers okay. during um, mm -hmm. the most horrific crime pattern years, mm -hmm. during the 80s, during the late, some, some even back to the, um, to the 70s. The, the mindset of um, something as foreign as saying good morning to someone walking right. on the block is like, are you kidding me? You know, we don't do this. <laughs> you know, we, we, we're not social workers. We, we go, yeah. go after bad guys. That is the problem. There needs to be a new emerging of some of these young cops I see who were the victims of aggressive policing 
who want to build bridges, um, they are having impediments mm -hmm. in doing so. We were at, we met a group of young officers in the nine old precinct who are spending their time going out and, and going to young people who had negative in interactions and talking to them and mm -hmm. grooming and developing these relationships. And just the obstacles are with the problem. The, 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 the policy makers are in the way of changing the paradigm of the effective police. Right. So I've got to ask, Donna, I mean, what difference does Washington make in all of this? Oh. <laughs> I mean. Well, well, you know, Rudy Giuliani may have not found a personal place in the administration, mm -hmm. but it's clear that 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 his um, his would be boss um, is is would like to turn the clock back to the bad old days, you know, and, and just to add to what the borough president says in terms of, you know, sort of how the current generation of, of police leadership grew up, they also grew up under the leadership of Rudy Giuliani, right, exactly. whose attitudes towards people in communities of color was like everybody is a suspect. So, so we have to turn that around. And it, by the way, is mind boggling that in New York City there should be such a gap when crime rates are at an all time low. I mean, we just have to like note that. But you know, one of the, the, the pr uh, proposals before the city council in New York is the Right to Know Act. And included in that legislation is a requirement that wherever possible, you know, officers at the beginning of a, an interaction with, uh, with, with the a community give out your card you know I mean just take a moment here's my card I'm officer so-and-so and 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 you know it seems like a simple-minded thing to do it seems like really is this like important but it what it would do is is just stop things and humanize the interaction yeah. from the get instead right. of up yeah. against the wall you said um, Judy before we started that there were some elements and I kind of simplified what happened around stop and frisk in New York but mm -hmm. there were some elements of the legal settlement in those cases that could feed into all of definitely, this in a good way. Definitely. What was that? I mean, we now have a case monitor, Peter Zimroth, who actually has come out very strong for what he calls robust evaluation. And he is in favor of actually having measures where police can be recognized for what they do well. Mm -hmm. And he identifies quality as being very important, right? And Donna has actually recommended that instead of just looking at the number of stops, we actually look at something called hit rate. And in this case, it would be the number of stops that actually result in an arrest or a summons. That is, they actually find drugs, alcohol, or whatever. And, and this measurement would really help police to make stops that are with reasonable suspicion, all right? And likewise, with the, with the thing with the community, we could have things in which they actually get measured for having that kind of right. dialogue. Maybe a no hit rate. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. 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 And so well, it pays yeah. off. So I hate to be a downer here, mm -hmm. and I'm coming to you with this, but I'm, I'm thinking about the story that you wrote in the Times that mm -hmm. I went and looked again that went back to your experience as a 15 year old, I think, yes. growing mm -hmm. up in New York City. And um, the way you were treated by the police, mm -hmm. you were detained you're going to a friend's house, you were held for many hours, and you were very explicit about how they physically kicked you, and not just anywhere, but in your genitals. Mm -hmm. They went for your 15-year-old African-American manhood, y you're right. right. We have a bigger problem, with all due respect, um, than just training and metrics, don't right. we? And right. a lot of people right. on this show would say we have an institution that's rooted in a certain history in this country that maybe is unfixable. Well, and, and, and I, don't, I don't think there is a one sound bite fit all right. answer. Um, because um, on all ends of the spectrum, you have those who believe that there should be no police in the community right. no matter what. And that's just not a reality. Then you have those that believe police do nothing wrong no matter what. Um, so 
there needs to be a reasonable thinking body of people who will shape policies that will address public safety. Because this is public safety. And public safety is important to me. People should not be the victim of predatory crimes. And we need to do everything to prevent people from carrying out those crimes and inflicting them on, on others. But when you look at, when we recruit police, we do not go to police heaven to get them. Right. <laughs> we get them from the... Same place we get politicians. <laughs> right. And, and, and all we... Same places where pedophiles are. Same places where people who are going through emotional problems. We have not been effective in identifying this person is harming the profession. Let's remove them from, from the profession. Anything, we do a safe haven and protect them. And we circle the rag, wagons around them. And I tell that to my police unions all the time. You are hurting your rank and file when you continue to protect the abusive um, police officer. New York, <clears throat> with Mayor Bill de Blasio, and you and some of the other folks we have in office, is clearly going to provide resistance, or I, I hope it's clearly going to res provide resistance to, to Trumpism and, and, and Trump. Right, right. And people, people should have a level of comfort in knowing that um, Trump's rhetoric it does not um, change what happened in the cities. Yeah. Um, you know, politics is like a golf game. You know, you drive for, for show, but you putt for dough. Local yeah. politics is where it goes. And as long as you um, keep your eyes on what's happening locally, your city council person, your aldermen for uh, Chicago's and other areas, your mayors, your governor mansion, your assembly people, senators, your lawmakers. So no matter what Trump states about stop and frisk, uh, the mayor appoints the police commissioner, mm -hmm. not the president. And so if we stay local, um, we will ensure that the conversation remains a, a suitable and sustainable um, way of life in our successes. He's lost weight. He's talking golf. He's doing good work. <laughs> Do I see a future mayor of <laughs> Adams here? Uh, everyone knows that uh, my desire is to one day become the mayor of the city of New York, but you don't get there by just wishing it. You have to earn it. Um, I want to do some good things in Brooklyn where Brooklynites can um, have just healthy families and understand the beauty of diversity, how we live among each other, and ensure that everyone has an opportunity to live in a city on a safe and not in disgrace. And whatever is for me, I had a great career in policing. Um, no matter what is meant for me, I'm, I'm open to it. Well, there you have it. Thank you, everybody. See, you can do a forward-looking conversation about policing. Maybe you could start one in the community where you live. You can get more information on our website. Thanks, everybody. Really great to have you. Thank you. There is one thing people on the left need to get deadly serious about under the Trump administration. Either we hang together, or as they say, we hang apart. Donald Trump is certainly deadly serious. Deadly serious about harassing, intimidating, vilifying, and removing all those he considers subversive. And his immigration program is just a start. More than two million people were deported under the eight years of the Obama presidency. That's greater than any preceding administration. The scope of Trump's plan builds on the law that Obama left in place and expands enforcement with thousands of new agents and enlisting the already expanded forces of local police and sheriffs. The targets, the White House says, are those people who are in this country and pose a threat to our public or have committed a crime. That was Sean Spicer. Note the phrasing, no crime is actually required other than posing a threat. We're talking about a dragnet of the sort last seen in the 1950s. Operation Wetback not only rounded up and carted off over a million people in brutal conditions a congressional inquiry later compared to slave ships, but also fueled and was fueled by a Red Scare, the same scare that was also targeting labor organizers, civil rights activists, and early environmentalists at the time. Then anti-communism fanned the flames of anti-immigrant paranoia. Communists were said to be flooding across the border. Today it's rapists and terrorists, criminals. The same criminals, let's recall, whom Americans have been taught to fear for years already justifying the militarization of our borders, our police forces, our schools, our streets, and in a different sense, our media and Hollywood. As we know from history, all those institutions can work seamlessly together to effectively suspend the Constitution for all of us. 
given enough public panic, Republicans in general and Trump, Bannon, and Pence in particular seem to love the 50s. And implicitly, the Cold War, wet back, Jim Crow, father knows best McCarthyism all those years brought. Although he declined to name it, the president praised Eisenhower's deportation drive in the debates last year. The witch hunts and migrant panics divided liberals and the left, split the labor and civil rights movements, and held back the coming together of a movement of movements that is so urgently needed at this moment. Who benefits? The beneficiaries then and now are pretty obvious. The ones to gain are big business, especially big agriculture, big prison, big war machine, and big police. Anyone, in fact, who profits off a poor and relatively powerless pool of workers. Who's hurt? Well, everyone else. So doesn't that put an awful lot of people in the same big boat? Think about it. I'm Laura Flanders. You can write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com, and tell me what you think. And watch our program or listen to our podcast every week.